I'm here today to introduce Father Al Saba, who is the uh, the the church the priest, the deacon, not the deacon, the priest at the, the dean, the dean at the Antiochian Church in Coral Gables, Florida. Father Fouled Saba was born into a family of Palestinian refugees and baptized an Orthodox Christian in Illinois. From a young boy, Father was attached to his heritage and Arabic language. In 2003, Father graduated from North Park University with a BA in Biblical and Theological Studies. Upon graduation, he was accepted as an Antiochian Archdiocesan Seminarian, <clears throat> excuse me, and in 2007, graduated from St. Vladimir's Orthodox Theological Seminary with a Master's in Divinity. Father has served, served as a church administrator, developed an adult lay edu educational ministry, and has lectured at numerous retreats. Father has close ties to many who are living in other parts of the world who are subjected to religious persecution in their daily lives. He is currently active in a movement, and this relates back to the film we saw earlier that Dr. Clemens showed. He's currently active in a movement to relocate Middle Eastern Christians living in refugee camps who have been left homeless. Father Saba was ordained to the Holy Priesthood in 2008 and currently serves St. George Antiochian Cathedral in Coral Gables, Florida. Father and Coria Diana, who are here with us today with their beautiful children. I don't know where they are. They might be out babysitting something right in the back end. Father and Diane are proud parents of two children and reside in Miami. With that, I'd like to introduce Father. Father? Brother of clergy, distinguished archons, faithful of the community of St. Catherine's Greek Orthodox Church in Naples, Florida, distinguished guests, and brothers and sisters in Christ, glory to Jesus Christ. Before I begin speaking about the situation in the Middle East, I first would like to offer my sincere thanks to Father Philemon and this dedicated community of St. Catharines, all the archons, especially Dr. Anthony Lambarakis and Mr. John Skirtis, for their commitment to raising awareness and calling for action regarding the plight of Christians in the Middle East and worldwide. The purpose of this symposium, as I understood it in the past few months in preparation for this day, is not only to raise awareness and not only to stand in solidarity with those afflicted, but to define and if needed to redefine the terms we use before we can call for action. For example, the following words, justice. Peace, freedom, oppression. We could hold symposium after symposium and a great series of symposia. But if we do not have 
proper definition. A proper definition of what we are saying. We cannot make anything effective. Let's take the word oppression by way of example. study the word oppression, one must know that there is a history behind this word. The word oppression means to press down, to hold down. And you get other words in that family, compress, depress, and so on. And the way we could understand it, oppression can also be not only to hold down, but to hold back. There's a common saying amongst my brethren in the Middle East and elsewhere, Middle Eastern Christians and Muslims, that the Oppression suffered under the Ottoman Empire for over 500 years held us back as a civilization thousands of years. You hear of this martyria, this witness, this suffering of the ecumenical patriarchate Turkey. We hear about ISIS, Al Nusra, and all these other groups, Boko Haram. We hear about the fanatical and unfortunate group called the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and elsewhere. But there are many things that are occurring that are part of the overall unfortunate dynamic. There have many, there are, there were many things that took place in the past 90 years that have nurtured ISIS. Whether the media knows or not, whether any one of us here is aware or not, we must take everything into consideration. I commend the Archons, this great order of the Saint Andrew, the Apostle Society, which has taken upon itself to defend. And defense means to move forward. You have to take the field. Remember the old days? You have to take the field to defend your land. What they did in the Revolutionary War. You cannot just sit there and defend and wait for them to go home. They're going to come back with another army. So we must take everything into consideration. For everything has played a role to produce what we have today called the crisis of ISIS. ISIS is not a new enemy. Just like the persecution of Christians is not a new thing. St. George Saint Demetrios, Saint Christina, Saint Marina, Saint Catherine were all Christians, young Christians who suffered and were killed and martyred, some as early as the third century, and millions before them in the first and second century. 
also persecution and suffering amongst the Christians is not a novelty. Neither is politics. What did the Lord say in Matthew chapter 10? Be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. Let me repeat. Be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. I believe, and I am convinced, and since I am not giving a sermon, I will use the word I. When I give sermons, I do not use the word I, because it must be a repetition of what the Lord says. I am not important. But today, I am not giving a sermon. If we are going to be wise as serpents, I am convinced that each of us holds in their own Christian confession a responsibility to our Christian faith for which millions were martyred. I have obscure ears, so this thing is... Uh, are we getting good? Actually, I have perfect ears, but don't worry. I am convinced that Christianity is under attack and has been under attack since its conception. When people talk about the first martyr, they always mention Stephen. There was one killed before Stephen. Stephen was the first martyr after the resurrection of Christ. But there was one killed before Christ. It was John the Baptist. Let us not forget the greatest one to ever be born of a woman. John, the forerunner, our Baptist Lord. And when he was killed, he was beheaded. He was beheaded because he preached against what was taking place in the administration of that local community. The abomination and actions of the king. I was very impressed two years ago to hear of this great conference in Berlin, Germany hosted, funded, sponsored, and executed by the beloved archons of the ecumenical patriarchy. As Dr. Lambaraki said, it cost over half a million dollars. It's very organized, and I'm sure the effects of which we will feel very soon. God willing. It was entitled Tearing Down Walls. There is a wall around the city of Bethlehem that needs to be torn down too. You see, my friends, I am not a politician. And I don't have time for politics. I have some of that in my parish. From day one, we eliminated it. And my friends, I must tell you, the people in the Middle East have no time for 
politics. Let me begin now. I stand here today not as a politician nor as an administrator. The frivolous world we live in, we must still answer all its challenges. But we left one person out today. What he thinks about what's happening in the Middle East. I know what the Archons think. I know what my brother clergy think. I know, in fact, what some of you think. That's one of my six senses that I have. But what does God think? So I will do nothing for the next 20 some odd minutes that I have left. I will do nothing except repeat what the Lord said in the holiest of books. Did you see that beautiful uh, image of the ecumenical patriarch on, uh, on Pascha? Everyone was outside with candles. For those of you who may not be Orthodox, we have this beautiful ceremony, beautiful service called the Rush Procession. Uh, in Arabic, it's... Uh, far greater of a challenge to, to, uh, to translate today, but uh, it's almost as if everyone is running to the doors. Al-Hajmi in Arabic. The ecumenical patriarch, like every one of my brothers, on April 12th, will take a censer at the doors outside and sense the gospel book. after it's read, before we enter the church and receive communion. Because the book, that gospel book, is Jesus Christ. That book is what today we are called to read from and to preach from and only from that book can you get justice and peace and genuine and utter freedom. It was written to free and liberate. It was written to teach and educate. For the Lord said in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of John, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. Notice, He is the way, truth, and life. He did not say, I am the life, the truth, and the way. John was clear. My question is, is Jesus Christ the way? Meaning, is he airport pulling road? No. Is he alligator alley? No. He is the way, meaning what he teaches is our way of life. And that way is freedom for all. Freedom from what? When the Lord sacrificed himself on a piece of wood, today called a cross, he freed us from suffering. He freed us from death. He freed us from oppression. But what is oppression actually? Oppression is not someone with a gun, not someone with a sword, not someone with a match. Oppression is to go backward 
to hold back. This is how you should teach your children. Do not tell them they are special. They are not special. Your child is not better than my child. Actually, maybe my child is a little bit different. You know, they have, uh, have some traits from the jungle somewhere, but and they are sitting in the other room listening to me. No, they didn't respond. Okay. My child is not equal to your child. And this is our problem today. It starts with you and your choice. Unfortunately. No one today is willing to even listen. Maybe Bob Simon did. God rest his soul. No one is willing to be a disciple. Everyone wants to be the teacher. And I use this example even in my sermons. When I was a child, uh, growing up in the 1980s, watching Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and the great Michael Jordan in Chicago play basketball. I grew up in my home, in our home, there was only one telephone on the kitchen wall. It was big, ugly, and green. And when the phone rang, despite for whom the call is, my father would answer. It was one phone for one family. There was one kitchen table. There were no laptops. There was not even a caller ID. We did not know who was calling. Caller IDs were invented and uh, sold first on January 1st, 1992. I remember because... I went into my father's uh, bedroom that morning and I said, Happy New Year, we need a caller ID. So we did not know who was calling. The family structure was intact for the most part. We suffered a little bit in the 1970s. The family structure was intact. The authority remained with the parents and in schools with the teachers. The Lord, when he taught, was rejected by some. And those who rejected him sought to kill him, it says three times in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10. And the Lord preached and predicted his own death. And in fact, in chapter 10, it's so beautiful, he elevates the prediction, not only will he fall into the hands of men, but into the hands of sinful men. Powerful. And today, many people take a look at the Bible, they hear the story, and they have the opportunity to make their own assessment and their own opinion. Okay, fine. Let's go down that road. Should not one first hear all the facts and consider everything before making such an assessment or bestowing such an opinion? And I'm being nice. What I'm trying to say is listen before you judge. Do not make a judgment until we know all the facts. We must understand through God's eyes. We must have the ears 
to hear his voice in and from the Holy Scriptures. We must know that history is repeating itself. There is nothing new under the sun according to Ecclesiastes. Two years ago, I offered my council an idea. Let's bury a time capsule to be opened on the 100th anniversary, 40 years from now, so our children can appreciate what happened 40 years earlier and before that. In fact. So we did so. We buried a time capsule into the founding wall of the church. And at that wall today, sits a plaque, clear, at the bottom of that plaque for the time capsule, there is a verse from Ecclesiastes, from the scriptures. What has been done, has been done, and what will be, will be, it doesn't matter. There is nothing new under the sun. 60 year anniversary, 100 year anniversary, people are all the same. At the end of the day, according to my father, everyone will look for just a piece of bread to fill their stomach. We all work so that we may live. We all work just to earn so we can buy some bread, as the good American saying, to put bread and butter on the table, not during Lent, perhaps, I'm not sure. Some eat it, some go, it doesn't matter. That if our goal is to live, and if all our work is to sustain our living, then we must know what is it? What kind of life should it be? The Archbishop of Mosul for the Syriac Orthodox Church in Iraq, in Mosul, Iraq, in my opinion, the only man left in Iraq. The rest, what's the word that we use here in America? The rest are chickens. The only one standing up like his All Holiness in Turkey. Mar Nicodemus Daoud of Mosul, of the Syriacs. He said, Living in my country without dignity makes me a stranger. And perhaps a foreign land with Dignity will become my nationality with time. So what is this life? Remember what he said, the Lord? I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is this life without dignity? What is this life if it is not according to the way given to us by the Lord through the Holy Scriptures. We are facing radical extremism in Africa, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. We even feel radical extremism in this country from several groups over the past 200 years. No one is better than anyone else. We must look even next door sometimes and we will see exactly what we saw on the screen. Not 7,000 miles away. This 
radical extremism. No one asked. Where did it come from? Since we are trying to live in the face and survive in the face of radical extremism, where did radical extremism come from? You cannot say we have to fight it and that's it. You have to know the source. Like a doctor, when he is trying to find out the source of the infection or what's, what, what have you. The doctor should not give you medicine. Correct me, Dr. Lies. The doctor should not give you medicine unless first he diagnoses you and finds the source. Again, I am not a politician, but I am the son of Palestinian refugees. And I witnessed my grandmother every day stand at 4.30 in the morning. This is serious, friends. We have to, according to the uh, program, we have to educate, it says in step four, step three. We have to educate ourselves. Step three. She stood every morning when I would be getting ready for work. And she would wait for the sun to rise. Which means she's facing where? She's facing east. Better than most of our churches today. And when the sun comes up, she kisses the ground. And she would pray the doxology. Glory to thee who has shown us the light. And in her prayer, and she would pray for 30, 40 minutes, I mean. Not like today. And now they do the guitar sometimes. She would pray and yearn to go home because she was kicked out of her home in 1947 by radical extremists. In fact, and I'll tell you this beautiful story. Some of you may not know Arabic, but I will translate. They left Jerusalem in 1947 and lived in Bethlehem and nearby Beit Sahur before moving to Ramallah and then eventually landing in Amman, Jordan in 1951. My father was born in 1953. So when they came to name him, all the women and the midwives were with her in the room while my grandfather was drunk outside celebrating. They asked her, what would you like to name him? I mean, this is life. She said, Rawhi, which means for her to go home. Because this, her son, was born outside her home, outside Palestine. And then my grandfather the next morning became sober and asked, what did you name him? And he changed the name to Musa and uh, so my father's driver's license says Rauhi till this day, and I named my son Musa. But radical extremism came out of oppression. It did not, uh, it was not born just like that, like a CVS on a corner every 30 days. 
radical extremism was nurtured from oppression and the oppressed became the oppressors. And this you will not hear on any of the mainstream media. So, you know, and you're getting it for free today. So my family, as they went through all of this, and I have family today in Lebanon. Uh, my my uh, aunt is a Roman Catholic nun uh, in Beirut, Lebanon, until this day. I have family in Jordan. I even have distant relatives in Damascus. And in Alexandria, in Egypt, actually, I have a relative. And all of them tell me the same thing and tell my father the same thing. No one is discussing the source of the problem. Radical extremism came out of oppression, not the other way around. Radical extremism, now all these extremists are just doing what they're used to. That's why, I know uh, I'm not a politician, but I'll tell you, the greatest mistake we did uh, in this country was remove Saddam Hussein. He had full control over all of these groups. And no one was able to raise his head. You blame him. Well, we had Waco, Texas. Same thing. Let's not play games. That's all I'm saying. We have the same thing everywhere. The greed of sinful men for power and politics and money. That is oppression. But it doesn't matter what I think. What matters is what God thinks. What does God say? Let's take, for example, the story of Exodus. The story of Exodus begins like this. Moses, born in the land of Egypt, grows up, is fed up by the oppression of his people, by the Egyptian pharaoh, and is virtually banned. Self-inflicted or otherwise, he's banned. And he lands in the desert, you could say. Somewhere. Right, Abuna? He became a shepherd. And notice how beautiful the scripture is that Moses and King David both began as shepherds. They had nothing to do with God in the beginning. They were called. And Moses went and as he was feeding his flock, he was called by God on the mountain. Mount Sinai, and you saw a picture of St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt uh, till today, uh, the longest running monastery in the world. And God told Moses, I want you to go to Egypt. My people, I have heard their groanings and I have remembered them. Now, if you know the story, you should laugh. What do you mean remembered them? He left them there for 400 years. What happened to God? All of a sudden, he received some medication and he, his brain completely turned around and he just remembered them? Obviously, it's his will. You can't and I can't do anything about that one. That's why the most important prayer is thy will be done. Whatever he wants. And many people question that today. Why is God allowing everything to take place? Like I tell my people, the Christians in the Middle East are not being tested. It's the Christians here that are being tested. The Christians here who are being tested. So God said, I remembered my people. Go, Moses, into the land of Egypt, into the lion's den. 
like Indiana Jones. Remember when he went back to Berlin in the movie? Into the lion's den. And you, Moses, are going to represent me, I, the Lord God Almighty, and you're going to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. So what did Moses do? I mean, this is the story of all of us. Uh, I'm busy. I have an appointment in the afternoon. Okay, Father, the service. How long is the service again? Unto ages of ages. And God said, don't worry. You can go to Pharaoh. I will be with you. No problem. Yeah, but you see, Lord, I'm not a good speaker. You know, I don't have those skills that what you're looking You're looking for somebody else. You're looking, you know, for someone like John Sturtis, you know, to go. And he said, no problem. So every excuse that Moses gave God... God found the solution. He said, I will send your brother Aaron with you. He will speak for you. In Exodus, and perhaps I think the only scripture, the only passage, says the following. Moses, to Pharaoh, you will be God. You have to read the Bible. Forget about everything else. To Pharaoh, you will be God, and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. We are starting a class on April 15 on Exodus. You're more than welcome to register. And what did he do? He went to Egypt. He said, okay, we're going to give this God a chance here. See if he's truly going to uh, uh, follow through. And he went. Now, you know the rest of the story. Uh, Let my people go. And Pharaoh said, well, no. I don't think so. I'm going to lose cheap labor, free labor. So they went back and forth, and frogs, and turtles, and I don't know what, and everything else came here and there. And then finally, the Lord delivered them. How did he deliver them? And this is the thing that bothers people. It bothers people. Even priests, I see sometimes, they don't like to read this part. Because they're afraid of hurting somebody's feelings. No, you have to read the scripture. If you don't read it, we'll find somebody else to read it. No problem. It's like some people in the altar. If you don't come, I will find somebody else to light the censer. What's the big deal? He sent the angel of death to kill the firstborn of Egypt. And he told Moses, Moses, You will kill sheep and take the blood of the animals and put it upon the door. And when the angel of death comes, he will pass over that home, that house. I mean, listen to how funny this story is. I have to get either new ears or new. And this is the point, my friends. He told him, put the blood of animals. And the angel of death will pass over that home. So eventually, Pharaoh, having lost his son, let the people go. And the people left. And when they got to the Red Sea, God said, Moses, hit that rod, open up the sea, and the people shall be saved. And when you get to the other side, hit the rod again, and the waters shall close. 
and it's not a coincidence, when he did that, he hit the rod in the shape of a cross, which is scripturally sound. Where did the people go from there when they crossed? They went into the same area, the same place where Moses had first seen God. And God gave him that mission to go to Egypt. What did God say exactly when he first came to Moses? He said, Moses, go tell Pharaoh. And this is the point of everything I'm trying to say. Let my people go. Bring them back here to me on this mountain. Bring the people back here to me. So the point was not the, the deliverance. The point was not saving the people from oppression. The point was to give them the law on the mountain. And he said, you shall take this law and then this will lead you to the promised land. Which we know, the real promised land. The land that God promised Abraham is not the land on the east side of the Mediterranean today. Big uh, game. This is the promised land. There is no earthly empire or earthly corner or place that is promised to us. And this is the point. If you could uh, perhaps, uh, I'll give you some homework until the next symposium next year. Read the book, the letter of Hebrews, especially chapter 11. We just read from it just a few weeks ago that it is the heavenly Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem, that I will be sending you to. The earthly Jerusalem has been conquered and destroyed seven times. It's irrelevant. My grandmother, when she left Jerusalem, she did not get upset because she left the Holy Land. She got upset and heartbroken because she left her home. Which happens to be the Holy Land. So if you were born in Greece, for you, if you check with any Yaya or Papu, he's going to tell you and she's going to tell you that the Holy Land is where they were in the village eating the grapes from the... I mean, come on! Some of you are nodding your head, which means you understand my Arabic. This is the point, friends. Do not take anything at face value. Do not judge a book by its cover. It could be boondoggle. It could be boondoggle. We have to see action. And my call to action today is the following. Despite an uphill battle, even in the face of the sword, we must find ways to spread the gospel and to do it now to teach even the extremists the right way. We will probably need some military intervention. We will need diplomatic efforts. We will need all of that. But if we do not have the gospel as our primary goal to teach it and preach it and instill it in the heart of anyone with ears, then we will have accomplished nothing because then even us will become our own form of extremists.
The gospel is the cure. And I have several doctors in the room. It is not the treatment. The gospel is the cure. It is the gospel of love, of compassion. I don't agree with many things my parishioners do, or I, but I will still love each and every one of them. I do not agree with what some of my teenagers are doing in schools or other places, but I will still love them because the gospel commands me to love them that perhaps through this love transmitted to them first from him to his son and then to his apostles to us that they could change. And I'm talking about Rocky IV style. When Rocky gave. The whole point of the Rocky IV movie in 1985 was for that last one minute when Rocky spoke. It was made as a political movie. Remember what he said when he won against the Russian? Don't get upset. Where's Vladimir? Don't get upset. He said, I noticed in the audience a change for the positive. And if I could change and you can change, everyone can change. Everyone. How can it change? If we do not give the best tool and the best resource for people to change, the cure. Even in my own church, I have some people telling me, Father, we should have more chanting and less of the reading of the Psalms. You know, all those Psalms, reading of Psalms. I don't even want to come on Wednesday night. There's so much reading from the Bible. And I said, well, I will eliminate all the chanting and all the but I will keep the reading of the scripture because that is even your cure. Despite all this persecution, and in closing, despite all this persecution we face today and have been facing for 2,000 years as a church, church remains. His All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch said that. We're still here. The Lord promised that even the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And sometimes we just need to be reminded that here is not the promised land. When we are persecuted, it is only a trial run for the great promise ahead, which is the true liberation and freedom that Christ grants us all. I finish with a quote from the Lord himself in the Gospel of John, chapter 16. Quote, I have said this to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world.